Welcome to Bomb Barn Q and A session number four. Today we'll talk uh -huh. about today we'll talk about working with orchestras and a few of the things we picked up along the way. We decided to introduce this sound to point out the end of the time for each answer, because basically we get a bit too waffly in these, and we thought that our, our videos should be analogous to a miniskirt. Short enough to be interesting, but long enough to cover the bare essentials. So, I'm here all week, try the veal. Uh, anyway, hope you're okay with that. I oh, know, yeah, where's the try? Anyway, hope you're all right with that. Let's, uh, let's kick off. Today I thought we'd talk about uh, recording with orchestras and working with orchestras and all of the foibles that comes with that, the issues that we've had along the way, and try and discuss what we've learned and whether there might be some gems in there for other people. So, uh, first of all, working with orchestras. So the, the first thing I thought to discuss was about you need a team of people. That's, that's the first thing we discovered right from the get-go. And we were very lucky that we uh, met James Fitzpatrick and he was our orchestral fixer right from day one. And he really filled in a lot of the gaps and actually tip number one would be find somebody who's very experienced because right at the very beginning finding him saves us a whole load of hassle because you you know there's so many facets to it and people that are involved you can't possibly know all about that right from right from day one so you need someone who will sort of hold your hand and take you through it and in the end you know we needed so he was the fixer we needed an orchestrator a copyist a translator there's an orchestral manager, and I, I'm not even sure I still know what the orchestral manager does. Do you know, Barn? Um, they manage the orchestra. <laughs> and they take money I think, off I us. Think, I, no, you know, reality, okay, right. in reality, that means that they actually, uh, yeah, they, they, keep the they, you know, they keep the players in check and everything else, and they make sure that everyone's arriving at a certain time, and they know what, the, you know, then everyone's... You know who's playing in each session and everything else. I mean, I think it might be actually before I, I'm going to dive in and say you might know, you might want to explain what a fixer is. A fixer. Um, well, he's kind of the 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 guy that does everything for us, really. I mean, he introduced us to our orchestrator. He um, he arranges for the musicians to arrive at the allotted time. And, you know, you, you tell him how many players you want in the string section, the brass section and so on. And he books the best players that are available at the time. And if somebody's not around, then he finds an alternative so that on the day you've got the right number of people sitting in the right number of chairs. Um, he organizes the booking of the studio. Uh, in our case, the translator. He also organizes copying. That is when you send all the scores through to people that they extract all the individual parts so you you know violin one violin two violas cellos double bass etc and then they print out the right number of copies for each of the desks so it's a very very involved process and you know i, I wouldn't want to micromanage all of that and the, the fixer kind of handles all of that for us so it takes a lot of the worry out because uh, our guy james fitzpatrick is a very safe pair of hands deals with that for us. I'm going to give him a better name. I think he should be a concierge. Concierge, yeah, actually, maybe that. Well, maybe I mean, that works. I mean, the fixer. T the term fixer actually is a is a shorthand for orchestral contractor. Uh, but it just got shortened. I don't know why it got shortened to fixer. I suppose because, as, as you say, he is. That's what he does. He just fixes everything for you and gets it out of your hair. I think I'm going to dive in and say a couple of things here. Um, one, I. I suppose because our background is in games, and in fact, obviously, when we got our first live orchestral gig, it was for a game. Um, at that point, we had spent many, many years, I think for me, 12 and Bob 6, doing everything ourselves. And so what we were expecting to do um, was to do it all ourselves and carry on, in fact, so in fact, working out how we would get the MIDI produced for the for, for each of the players, and else. we would we would have done it ourselves. And it wasn't until um, I think Michael Price actually and uh, James Bay suggested, no, we need a posse. It's the kind because I, I, I know, the games industry, the mentality is you do it all yourself. And I think we would have planned on doing it on ourselves had we not been told, no, this is a whole 
this is a whole area of expertise you know don't do no, don't know a great deal about which is true i mean we had spent i think we had probably written three or four orchestral scores at that point but obviously they were all programmed and so we weren't following any any rules other than the rules we made up for ourselves we were trying to write within the confines of the orchestra but of course i imagine we probably cheated in a fair few areas because we didn't have any we didn't have anything telling us otherwise we if we wanted to write three violin one parts we could write three violin one parts but once we got into the realms of you know, working with the real orchestra we had to then sort of knuckle down and work out a great uh, exactly how how this how this process works it is indeed a machine and uh, and the machine gets it all gets and obviously i mean a lot of it is all about preparation whether you were recording it in eastern europe to to save money or you're recording it in london or in or in wherever you're recording it doesn't matter where you're recording it as long as what's what, what when you turn up on the day everything is already in place because the one that you can you can say is that the most expensive part of all of this is sitting in front of a, a city of an orchestra people because if if the score isn't right, if there's something wrong with it, you've got to fix it whilst they're all sitting there, costing hundreds or hundreds of pounds an hour, maybe even thousands of pounds an hour. So the last thing you want to do is make any mistakes and make sure that whenever you turn up, what sat in front of the uh, the conductor, what's in front of the musicians, is all just ready to go. Um, so that doesn't matter where you record. And all it, these little lessons, we knew nothing about. So can you so test it, that? I mean, if you've got it all printed out and so on and so forth, do you read through them and check that through? Or do you have somebody who is experienced as an orchestrator and knows, yep, that's going to translate fine? Well, in our case, uh, we what's, we gave the, uh, the MIDI and the MP3s of what we produced to the orchestrator, who was going to be the conductor. And actually, up until recently, we relied upon what he did to be right. I mean, he in fact he never sent. I, I think probably up until when was the last, when was the project he first sent us some stuff back, Bob? I can't remember, but it wasn't for another. It wasn't for a few years. He we would literally send him off the track and the MP3 of what our mock up sounded like, and then rely upon what he did um, would work when we got to the when we got to the recording studio. We actually just completely just handed the whole process off. And it wasn't until probably the last five or six years we actually thought maybe we should check this stuff. Because of well, course Well I'd say I'd else. say one thing, you know, he's he's a human being. I mean he's a remarkable human being, our orchestrator, Nick Rain, but he's a human being, you know, of course little mistakes can creep in here and there. And we really should check things because the worst the worst nightmare is what's that note on the cellos it seems to be clashing with what the violas are playing in bar three note number four and you, oh god i don't want to be thinking about that i want to be sitting there thinking about how it sounds and thinking about the quality of the recording and so on that's also i mean we're, we're sort of jumping ahead because that's that's one of the reasons we don't conduct actually because we like we like to sit and hear the thing as a whole and you can't you can only really do that properly from the control room I mean, many, many composers do conduct, um, but that's not something we've ever really gotten into because I find it more useful to, to hear what's going down on tape. But uh, anyway, uh, I've just, we've gone four minutes there, so we probably need a ding on orchestra. I thought it was going to be a two minute ding, isn't it? Well, two minutes, minute. I know exactly, but it's four minutes. So let's, let's, let's do a ding. And now let's go okay. on to... Um, Copying, because actually copying is, it's a it's a massive area in itself that you don't really think about. I mean, you know that you need scores, and you know that the scores need preparing, and you know that Cubase or Logic Audio has a score preparation tool. So you sort of just think, I'll do all the MIDI, and then I'll just quickly run it through that and get all the scores off. It really isn't that simple. And, you know, when, when you do actually pull that up, you realise doesn't have a key it doesn't have a clef it doesn't uh, all the notes are not properly quantized to, to sit exactly where they should on the stage it's basically completely unreadable so it needs to be sorted out from that perspective but um, there's there's a lot more involved even beyond that because once you've then pr produced the entire score for that whole piece you know there's there's many many parts to it and even within that, the violin one section's got 16 players in it, most likely. 
and so there's probably four different stands so you need four copies of each page for just the violin ones so that process managing that process is handled by a copying team in our case because we predominantly record in Prague they handle that process for us and it's not something we ever get involved in and we trust them and they've always got it right we trust them to print the right number of copies and stick them on all the right desks in the right order on the day and actually the order is something that the fixer also handles for us because he also produces the session but I think that's my two minutes anything to add to that barn okay well I, well first of all I'm not sure we really covered orchestration because you've sort of defined copying as part of orchestration orchestration is we will give uh, orchestrator a co a, uh, a MIDI file so all the parts that we've written out unfortunately now we've done this enough times to to write the parts in theory is quite close to how they would sound by the real thing so we're not just writing brass parts we're writing stuff for french horns for bar for trombones for trumpets and so on and so forth and the same with the strings we will actually uh, spread out the string parts and uh, and to try and work out how that so basically over the years our our mod our midi demos our mock-ups sound closer to the real thing and the orchestrator will take that and reference the midi files which will send them all the notes and all the data and then they will produce a score. Now, the score itself, it could, it might just import the MIDI files. It might actually just actually just literally type the notes in himself. But he won't do it in a, in a sequencer. He'll do it in a, uh, a score notation package, which he uses to Valius, the other one's Finale. And that is for producing the actual score, which is prepared to be played. And it's also, more importantly, one, one where we missed out was dynamics. Not only do we have uh, to make sure that all the rhythms, all the notes, all the staves are written properly, and all the right keys for the various different... Uh, Makes of the orchestra, but more importantly, the the dynamics, the loudness, the the expression, all the uh, all the uh, all the exp yeah, all the expressions we're adding, whether they whether it be crescendos, decrescendos, all your, all your markings to describe how the notes should be played, they are all added by hand. And at the time, uh, and then once that is produced, there is a single file, there's a Sibelius or a Finale file, which has got the master score. Uh, which has got everything for all the instruments, all black, uh, choirs, but all all laid out uh, in one big, big, big score, which normally gets printed out as a three fours. And then the copyist, they will take that Sibelius or Finale file, and they will extract it, print out each part for each player. But more importantly, they will, one thing they do, which which we haven't talked about, is they will make sure that page turns. I'm not the microphone there. Page turns don't happen on really awkward moments. So they'll actually. They'll actually don't just copy it from. They actually move the scores around in uh, in Sibelius or, fin or Finale to make sure that when the page is printed, that you're not in the middle of a really fast run and you suddenly got to change page. So they make sure that all those things are, uh, are worked out so that the the the, the, uh, the page turns happen on the most uh, the most uh, the most appropriate point. So yeah, that is the t that is that is the the job of a copyist to mo make sure that the scores are produced for each of the players. There and obviously the right right copies for each uh, each member of the uh, each members of the orchestra, and, uh, and then they will actually produce they actually normally produce the master scores for us, uh, which will be uh, a couple of these big A three scores. In fact, I'm going to go and get one in a minute. While Bob is shouting, I'll go and get one, and uh, then they'll produce little smaller master scores for anyone else sitting in the control room at the session, so they can all everyone's reading through the scores to make sure that nothing's being missed. And suffer the engineers we, in the paper past. It was a tape up as well, and to make everyone's got a master's copy, so they don't well, basically know where everything is, so that we're all and hopefully in tandem when they hit record. Is that my two? Have I done? Have I gone uh, over two minutes? Almost certainly, but at least it wasn't twenty-five <laughs> minutes like we were doing on our last video. So that's good. That's, that, that, there you go. That's my that's my point on orchestration. It was we're, all killer, we're keeping, no filler. Yeah, yeah, we're keeping. <laughs> I like that I'm one. That's nice. That's nice, Kevin. I like it. Um. So actually, the, so the next thing I had on the bullet point was recording. There's, no, there's let's talk about him. He's just gone. <laughs> I'm here. I'm here. Oh I'm yeah, here. damn. Here. He can still hear us. <laughs> um, with the recording, there's not really an awful lot to say really about recording. Um, I touched on um, whether to conduct or not. I mean, many composers do. It's not something that we've ever done because we like we like hearing the final thing. But um, previewing performances. Hang on one second, Barn. I'll just finish this and then show that. No, no, that's fine. Um, so, yeah, previewing performances. I mean, of course, we want to hear it back, but often we have a lot of additional backing tracks and we, we often will keep things deliberately in synth. For example, 
um, a synthesized timpani can sound very realistic these days. They've got uh, so many parameters that you can control. You can create it, recreate it in synth very accurately. And in that instance, I mean, why why would you go and record that and add it into the mix with everything else? Because then you na now no longer have the ability to separate that out. And for us, that can be very useful in the, you know, further down the line when we're working on video games, it can be pretty useful to have a lot of the percussion or all of the percussion separately so that you can add them in or take them out and you've got total separation if you keep it in synth. And this, this can be a problem when you record everything live together in one room. So the only other way of doing it live and having separation is to record them in separate passes. But then that gets very expensive. So you have to really plan and schedule that quite carefully if you want to go down that route. So what we what we usually do is a little bit of all of that. So we'll we'll have maybe if we've got a, a very percussive rhythmic string section playing some sort of a part that that is very dynamic, then we, we would have that recorded as a separate pass. We'd mark it on the score that that would be the case. And then with then other than that, the strings record everything as normal. And then we just go back and overlay that. Of course, you have to make sure you don't miss anything because that would be very disappointing to get home and say, ah, where's that? So we've never had that so far. We've always managed to, we have some very complicated spreadsheet with tick boxes and all sorts going on. So we've always managed to get it right thus far. But there's not really much else to say, I think, about recording from my side anyway, because we just sort of place our faith in their hands, let the engineers and the assistants sort of do their thing really. And we just make sure in the control room that we're hearing what we want to hear and that we're getting adequate performances in each and every case. Because you, you do the same thing three or four or five times. But as long as there's one good performance for each and every bar, then the rest of it can be sorted out in editing, which is coming next. Anything to add, Barn? Um, I suppose from the recording perspective, yes. Most of our record, I would say 90% of our scores have been recorded in Prague. We've been going there since 2002. And in fact, every single score we've recorded in Prague, must be 15 or 20 of them by now, have been engineered by the same chap. He's won multiple, is it Grammy Awards? Yes, for doing Adele albums. Uh, his name is Jan Holtzner. He was the uh, in-house engineer at the uh, Smacky Studios. And yeah, it's been a, a fabulous experience. He's been a very, very safe pair of hands and recorded all of our scores. Uh, it's interesting how when we first went to Prague, they didn't have Pro Tools. They were recording in a uh, Tascam DA88, which effectively mm. was old school recording to tape. It was digital tape, but it was still going recording to tape. And everything was recorded in the same room at the same time. Uh, as, as time has gone on, they have in, uh, indeed invested in a, uh, a decent high-end Pro Tools rig. And now, so one thing Jan has to do, which we have to also bear in mind before we go to the session, is that at least a couple of days before, we have to send all the MIDI files uh, of our session over to, um, to Prague so that he can prepare the click tracks. Uh, in this case, cause especially if you're doing film stuff, there are, it's, it's, quite, it's quite common that uh, a film cue would change tempo a lot and sometimes change, change, uh, change key signature as well in the, during, the, during the space of one cue, largely because you're simply trying to make something fit to picture. And uh, because they haven't edited the picture, you are trying to make this you know, as a love scene and it goes to an action scene and it goes to not a love scene. You, none of these things have been edited with music in mind. They're edited to make the thing pace beautifully. But in terms of make the music fit, uh, it would mean that we have to sort of juggle around by speeding something up, slowing it down, maybe making a bar of three, four next to a bar of four, four or five, four, just to make everything fit. But once you're recording that, it needs to still be uh, effectively, it sounds like it's a piece of music which flows and uh, and the orchestra therefore needs to need to hear everything in their, in their headphones, click track, which, may, which will sync up to this. And so we will produce our, our MIDI files, which we send over to the uh, orchestrator, for him to do the orchestration and make all the Sibelius files or something else. Uh, but then either we'll send the same MIDI files over um, to the guys in Prague or actually we'll get, if, if Nick has moved, slightly moved something around to make it work from his perspective, he will send the MIDI files over to Prague so that then uh, they can prepare, they can effectively open up the MIDI files within um, 
in Pro Tools. They don't really use any of the, the, the note information the data, but the one thing they do use is the template information and the key signatures. So, and then they will use this to create a effectively a tempo map of each queue. And we always have to make sure we have enough, I think it's probably normally, basically it's about two bar counting. So we have to make sure that that, so he has to do, so Jan has to do all of this work before the session starts to make sure that when they hit record, it's two bar counting and bosh, all the click track, which everyone hears in their ears, it is going to accommodate what they're seeing on the page. But in terms of that, other than that, the recording, yeah, we, we sort of hand, we, we, we keep our hands away from uh, how he does it. There were, there were what's they call is it Decca tree? I think you remember the name. There yeah. was a, a wonderful tree of microphones, which pretty much sits above uh, the conductor, uh, which literally sort of like comes up probably a good twelve feet, fifteen feet in the air, and literally is like a tree of microphones. Each of the sections have different microphones. Some have more than others, um, and and there's overheads. And I mean the way they set it up, I I have no in, you know I have no knowledge about it. I just rather leave it to them and say you know make it sound good. And that's it. Ding ding. As Bob says. Ding ding. Recording. Ding ding. Okay. End, okay, my end of recording up. round. I will end of round. I'll go and get. I'll go and get now. Let's have a look at the be score. Told off by the manager. Now let's have yep. a look at that score that you got. Oh yes. So this is. I just have to pick up a random score. This is from the film Amsterdam. This is session number three. I have just randomly picked up. A, 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 a score is not particularly lot on this page. This is um, this is M13, which is simply uh, Q number 13, just so my name. And so the top section here, I don't know if you can see any of this, we have the uh, woodwind section. And you can see already, this is that's the time code, if you can't see that, it's 10, 14, 28, 30, 23, which is where this starts in the film. Uh, this is the tempo, uh, it starts at 110. This top section, the, the, you read it effectively left to right. Everything plays at the same time. So there's no, this just starts with, it's actually, it's actually got, for some reason, actually got the clicks in there as a separate line. But uh, so we've got piano. So we've got so the uh, sorry the, the woodwinds at the top. Uh, then there's no there's no brass in this particular cue. Then we've got harp, piano, and the strings at the bottom. So it's violin one, violin two, viola, cello, and bass. Let's see if I can find a more interesting page where there's more a lot more notes happening. Uh, let's. Oh okay, so it's a small cue, but a bit more notes happening. Yes, okay, so this is a very short queue. N54, De Desiree leaving, number two. Again, the time code there. You can see this time code, actually, that stays, Manamosa, 87 BPM. Um, is this the, is it bar? I don't know why that bar. No, it didn't work. No, for some reason, it starts at bar 11. I think it's probably because there's stuff before then. And you can see, again, click tracks here, harp. So this, this, this section, this session, we have no brass. We've only got... Uh, woodwinds, harp, piano, and, uh, and strings, and I think it's a quiet bit there, and it all gets a bit, bit of a lump, a nice kind of actiony bit right towards the end. Lots of notes and lots of space. So, uh, and that's another thing we haven't discussed here as well is that uh, the recording order. Uh, we let James organise the recording order because what you don't want to do is have lots of very heavy ex action cues with the brass all blowing really loud and everything else on next to each other because they need a break. So again, it's something we never we never we never considered until we started this. But you have to sort of juggle it between um, loud stuff, quiet stuff, to give the orchestra a rest, like anywhere else. They're all human, and uh, they need a break. So we just don't yeah just do a big action cue. Then have a nice quiet cue, love cue, and next to it and everything else. And um, and one thing this this particular example has shown us is that different sections, so different sessions, are different recording sessions, which are all four hours long. Uh, uh, they have a different uh, orchestral arrangement depending on what we're recording. And these particular ones, this whole session didn't have any brass because it was going to be wasteful for the brass player to sit there and not do anything. So we organised, so again, this is something which I'm sure James would have come up with to say, well, maybe you need a session just without brass to save a bit of money there. And probably be a, I'm sure there'll be a session later with brass, so maybe we're not, not without, wood, without woodwind. So there's so many different um, thing uh, elements to juggle during the recording session to so make sure it all goes four smooth. hour sessions um do you get a chance to go back to the hotel and listen to what they've done already just to make sure there's nothing missing or nothing is changing on the fly or anything like that truth is we don't actually we never we don't they well truth is no simply because we don't get a chance to hear black back unless we're very lucky we occasionally if something normally if something something has gone wrong 
we're not all we're not something we're not sure about we'll ask them to play back that recording in the set during the session but because we're time is normally a very you know very limited you normally can you um you can normally assume to record about five minutes of music an hour so it's not a lot so in a four-hour session you're only looking at about 20 minutes of music so it's and they have I think two or three breaks to have to have. So there's quite a lot and and, uh, and there's a nice big clock at the top, which is that where everyone's looking at it and going, uh, right, click you no know, close to a break time where they're going to have a cup of tea and have a have a wee and everything else, and they come back and yeah. <laughs> oh well, uh, sadly we are, but uh, that's yeah, and that, that's what that way, the way it works. But yeah, so um, but yeah, so there is a combination. So we gen we very rarely unless something goes wrong, which a couple of times it has where the, or the conductor will come back to the control room and go, can I hear that back? Because that's not quite sounding right. Um, it's obviously, again, it's only, only something we can do if we have um, the time to do so. But normally, you're, you're up against it. You're trying to record a lot of music. And quite often, we're sitting there going, we're sweating, going, we're never going to get this done. We're never going to get mm. this done. A good, rule so, yeah, of thumb, so that, a good rule of thumb about that, actually, is definitely don't consider trying to record more than 20 minutes of completed music in any one four hour session 20 minutes is pretty much the maximum that we've that we've ever managed to achieve and you know if you can get it more like 15 minutes it means that they get proper chance to rehearse the cues and really get them sounding great otherwise you're going to end up with in some cases some pretty ropey performances and it, you know if you really had a great big budget and you could book a lot of sessions you know bringing that number down means more rehearsal time for the for the players and that means better performances ultimately so there's a yin and yang with that you just have to um you have to cut your cloth according to your budget really um that's that's the rule there um. 